Welcome to the afternoon session for this MRV workshop for transport project. So we will have uh, uh, two presenters here, one about MRV methodology, the other one about the MRV tools in transport projects. So in, in, uh, in this MRV methodology uh, session, we will talk about the first about the CDM, how the performance of CDM on transport project, and then also how the CDM do the MRV of transport project, and then what kind of lesson learned we can have from a CDM through the simplify the CDM methodology as basis for MRV for GCM or POCM. So as uh, Eric already mentioned about the CDM, this is uh, like a clean development mechanism, one of the flexible mechanism under Kyoto Protocol, as you already uh, have information about the when this uh, uh, mechanism coming, and then how it works, etc., from Eric's uh, presentation, and basically this stimulates uh, sustainable development and emission reduction from, as Eric mentioned, target country and also like the uh, the, the the other uh, proponent of project. Uh, through the to meet their reduction limited target. So as we already inform you that uh, in transportation sector especially, the performance of CDM in transportation project is very low. So uh, as er mentioned by Eric, on the pipeline maybe we have around 50 projects, among seven more than 7,000 uh, registered CDM, but among uh, 50 in the pipeline, only 27 that register as a transport CDM project. And most of them are located in China or India. This is the uh, several approved CDM methodologies applicable for transport sectors, which consists of bus system, especially bus rapid transport system, and MRT system, which also include cable car, this is a MS3U, and also high speed railway system, which is intercity uh, transport uh, project, and also energy efficiency, fuel switching, and also transport cargo and technology improvement for driving. The, the, in the CDM, they, 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 they divide the small scale reduction project with the categories as AMS. So here, AMS3, C, S, A, A, P, B, C is uh, they categorize as a small uh, reduction of uh, CO2 emission on greenhouse gas emission reduction. But for the large project, they usually uh, they, they use uh, AM. And MRT, they use ACM because they also uh, is complicated uh, system. So because they take into account the ac ac access and egress system. So they have a different different with the bus system or other high speed railway system. So how the CDM works, this is the pro uh, project cycle that uh, you may uh, already understand. So first the project participant should make a project design document. This is the first step. And the second one, as also mentioned by uh, Eric, the uh, project participants should get approval from national uh, uh, des designated national authority. After they get approval from nas uh, national level, and then they need to have a valid validation process from uh, DOE, designated operation entity. After they get approval from the DOE, and then the CDM project can be as a registered CDM transport project. If you already register, and then you need a uh, project participant need to have uh, to collect the data for monitoring uh, based on monitoring plan that you submitted when you uh, submit your uh, CDM project. Then the uh, DOE again will verify your uh, monitoring process, whether is it fit with your plan or not, how many uh, uh, how many different between your plan and actual one, 
and then what the actual one it will be certified as certified emission uh, reduction in the exact amount that already monitored so this is the way how the CDM process for transport sector and then you can imagine how the process will take in place in transport project therefore uh, we can see here that for several projects of transport it takes very long to get certified the CDM project for example in uh, Metro Delhi it took almost 2,000 days to register as the project the, the small one like a biodiesel from transport is a little bit uh, simple so if you see the AMS one basically it takes less day to certify it as a CDM transport so there's also trend uh, CDM uh, also they also improve the CDM register so I mean uh, number of days to register for the CDM in transport so basically recent years uh, it took, took less days compared to the early of a CDM uh, in the process so you can see in this figure so how the CDM do the MRV this is more important most important thing you need to know first they need to have a baseline and project emission they need to have a measure and monitor by project participant this should be monitored by project participant and also measured by project participant and then the other important thing is like uh, how to collect and record data and report it to the DOE signated <coughs> operation entity under UNFCCC and the third one how to verify and certify the data by the DE again, DOE again. So, most crucial one is how the DOE to uh, assess your report and then how they verify it and then how they certify. It. Therefore, in a, in a after registration and then uh, issuing CR it takes sometimes uh, more than uh, 200 days from uh, registration to issuing CR as shown in uh, this slide for, for BRT Bogota number one and then almo almost same, similar to Bogota number two BRT Bogota number two and also Bogota number three but if you look at the Metro Delhi it took more than 700 days to, to get a, a certified emission reduction so that, that, uh, from the CDM we, we found some challenges like uh, number, numerous parameters to be monitored which usually take long times for DOE or UNFCC Secretariat to verify and check the accuracy and then uh, monitoring method sometimes is not impractical and then also we found a lack of clear guideline for MRV approach such as in the sampling in sampling and then also sometimes DOE has less capability to do verification in some case This is the example data need for AM0031 run for bus system. First indicator is like a, what kind of transport mode used in the absence of the project. In doing this, uh, we need to do passenger survey to quantify, uh, to exactly measure what kind of modes are taken by passenger without project 
which is here a PRP project. If we don't have this data, and then we cannot move forward for the CDM process. That's the one obstacle of CDM process. They are very rigid in the process. And the second one, for example, like a field types of different modes. We usually get the data from a local statistic or local statistic office. <coughs> and then average speeds, we also sometimes get data from local statistic uh, bureau. And also uh, other type, like uh, mode and field type, we can uh, refer to IPCC. They, also, they already have a, a guideline for that one. And also fuel emission factor, we can use IPCC default value. And about the total number of passengers on the new system, we need to record per entry station because as we mentioned in the, for example, like uh, in MRT project or other pro uh, on our PRT because they want to exactly count the amount of reduction. So when the, uh, where the entry station and then where the out of station, they need to exactly measure the total number of passengers. So what the difference is between CDM and NAMA in, in terms of uh, the process, something like uh, CDM is uh, usually run for Annex 1 country with the uh, compliance to Kyoto. And then uh, NAMA sometimes can be uh, used by your own country and also they also have a market-based NAMA. Basically, usually they have a, for CDM is coordinated by private or public sector also possible, but uh, NAMA mostly coordinated by public sector or government officer. And then baseline and monitoring via CDM methodology. As for NAMA, baseline MMRV system not yet defined, so not yet established, very well established. And then uh, for CDM, finance through the market mechanism, while for NAMA is uh, more free. There's more another option, not only market mechanism. And the next one, defined by PDD and CDM methodology, and in NAMA is a little bit broad, sectoral approach beyond CDM is also possible. So from this above material that we can identify issue, listen from the CDM, first is how to simplify existing CDM methodology. And then the second one, how about the cost effectiveness or uh, opportunity cost for data collection and its impact on estimation of emission reliability, reliability of es estimation emission reduction. And then the third one that's more also crucial for uh, from lesson from CDM is uh, capacity building, how we transfer the accumulate capacity because the CDM usually uh, initiated by private sector, they have uh, their own capacity to do that one, while in uh, the, the next process like NAMA or others is if we should, uh, initiate by local government, how the local government can improve their capacity to do this similar approach. So the next one, I will try to give you some overview about the how to simplify MRV methodology under joint credit mechanism. So as you may know that under the framework of UNFCCC framework, there is a several mechanism. First part is about the mechanism under Kyoto Protocol, <coughs> which consists of CDM the joint implementation, etc., and the other one, bilateral or domestic or voluntary, which uh, include the GCM and also uh, uh, voluntary NAMA, etc., and also non-market mechanism. There's also another mechanism. So under this bilateral mechanism, uh, Japan has the uh, idea to uh, have uh, Japan uh, joint credit mechanism with the bilateral 
uh, using the bilateral relation between Japan and host country as uh, here uh, Japan will offer like a leading in uh, carbon technology that can reduce the uh, emission from a project and then uh, through this mechanism the host country can reduce the GHG emission by using the uh, advanced technology with the amount of reduction can be credited from Japan and also host country. So in this case, the next question is how we can use the reduction first, how we can measure and also how the methodology that developed for the uh, MRV methodology for reduction. This one is certified as the uh, methodology that accepted by the community. This is uh, the first question. So therefore, because of the MRV methodology is not yet well established for this one, we, we I just focus on developing MRV methodology, especially under this scheme, uh, joint related mechanism. So uh, recently, through the bilateral cooperation, there are several countries that already signed the uh, bilateral cooperation with Japan, like uh, Mongolia, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Vietnam, and Indonesia, and uh, Laos, I, I heard that one. So through this mechanism, we can develop like a suitable methodology for a certain type of uh, project or activities. So, and then the question is how to do simplify transport MRV methodology. First, we can use, for example, like initial default value. We, uh, as in the CDI process, they need to have a survey. But here, first, how if we use like a modeling tools or how if we use a default value or like a ex ante estimation. And the second one for monitoring, is it possible with or without monitoring? How the uh, possibility top-down uh, approach or bottom-up approach? And then how we adjust the value as ex-post verification? Then the four key point is like a, we need to open mind that we 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 possible to use like a default value, and also benchmarking from uh, which other city we are referring. And also, if possible, with or without monitoring, with the top-down and bottom-up approach, and also adjust our initial value after verification. That's the several uh, approach that we can do to simplify uh, transport MRV methodologies. I will talk detail one by one with case-by-case uh, case in uh, several cities that already developed some uh, GCM uh, based on the GCM a feasibility study that done by Ministry of Environment in several cities in ASEAN. So the first case is a bus improvement program at the Fianchen Lao. This done by uh, Ministry of Environment with the uh, Czech in a fiscal year 2012. So I will compare between the UNFCCC, AMS3C, and then MRV for GCM which developed by the, this uh, group. So as the reference, MRV GCM developed based on the referred to UNFCCC method that already was established, but they modified somehow in some part for this one to, uh, uh, to simplify the MRV methodologies. So the eligibility first for UNFCCC is like a for vehicle passenger and freight passenger, while in MR for GCM MRV is for public bus, and then a new electric vehicle or hybrid vehicles for passenger and freight. This only focus on bus, new bus and, and or retrofit bus. The biofuel is excluded in the UNFCCC method, and then a replaceable or chargeable battery are allowed with special documented measure. So for the basis 
for the methodology for the basic calculation in the UNFCCC, they use a, a bottom-up approach, which is a, a annual activities like vehicle kilometer travel. But in a new methodology that developed by GCM, with a, uh, with a two possibility. First, by top down using a monitoring data of fuel consumption, and then without monitoring fuel consumption, which is a uh, uh, bottom up approach, uh, annual activities per year, which is almost similar with the UNFCCC. So they, they try to have an option how to calculate the CHG emission. For bus operation, because is it a fixed route and schedule, so number of service in per day is easily to get. We can easily get the data for that one. And therefore, daily activity is easily monitored also. F fuel consumption is also monitored more accurate because this is from actual condition. Bus usually operate by private company and then uh, fuel consumption and fuel uh, purchasing or something like that, fuel expense is uh, fixed. We can easily to get the data, and therefore, in in case of uh, using a uh, bottom-up approach, vehicle kilometer trans travel, we need to adjust with like a fuel efficiency. While with the fuel consumption, we don't need to adjust with fuel efficiency. In a, in a fuel efficiency may, may differ depend on the several factors like a traffic jam or other etc. So we need to have a several factor which uh, influence on the fuel efficiency. While for fuel consumption is directly goes to the fuel consumption, and then we can obtain the emission reduction. In the UNFCCC for uh, uh, bottom-up approach, they require monitoring for all vehicles, is, which is uh, difficult in, uh, in the field. And also, we, there's also possible to monitor representative sample, but we need to follow uh, standard of uh, minimum sample. And then uh, for a specific fuel, Consumption, we need to monitor for our vehicles, and then also we it's also possible for some samples with the uh, international standard for that one. For the new uh, approach, we we only need to have monitoring of fuel consumption, and we don't need to monitor for all vehicles. But in the in this uh, GCM uh, in this met approach, in this method that developed by Jack. They didn't mention clearly about uh, how many percent of vehicle we need to observe about the fuel consumption. And then if we thought monitoring fuel consumption, and then we need to follow the fuel efficiency based on the uh, follow the CDM approach. That's uh, for the case study one about the past. The second one is about the case study for MRT. This uh, case study did in Bangkok, uh, MRT in Bangkok. So for simplify the methodology, we refer to SCM0016 version 3, where the eligibility first is for, for a new urban MRT and or ex it extension. While for the, the new method is developed for new urban MRT, including extension. And then the difference is uh, there's a point of technology transfer from Japan here. That the difference with the UNFCCC approach. And then, as I mentioned uh, previously, the, the boundary set in the SCM0016 is include access and egress, which is uh, sometimes difficult in uh, practically. And so the new simplified method is try to exclude access and egress. So they are focused only in the line of uh, 
MRT services on the MRT section only. We, 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 we didn't include how the passenger come to the station and then how the passenger go, from the st go out from the station. So we only focus on the, the line. Uh, for the method developed by UNFCCC, they didn't consider uh, vehicle speed change due to the uh, improvement of, because if we install MRT on parallel road with the uh, normal road, there may be improved on the trans, uh, vehicle speed in the parallel line. This, this is, it, it, it doesn't take account in the UNFCCC approach, but in uh, our new simplify uh, GCM method, it consider. <coughs> so, for to calculate the modal, uh, because basically this uh, two approach is based on the modal shift. So, in the UNFCCC approach, uh, CDM approach, they use uh, uh, basically for modal shift, they use interview survey, and then the stipulated calculation option is followed. But the, under the new simplify method, we can have two kinds of approach. First, without survey is also possible, and then with a survey. So we have an uh, option here, with or without survey. And then how to calculate the vehicle change is, as I mentioned in the CGM approach, is not considered. In this approach, we consider a certain distance of affected road within one kilometer parallel to the MRT line. And then we use a traffic volume survey for, to monitor and then using a, a volume per capacity approach. So this is a detailed one. For calculation of modal speed, usually uh, for CDM, they use a OD matrix or OD survey. And then also, they also have an expansion factor to improve the survey accuracy. And under the new approach that developed for the GCM, they use a with, without survey and with survey. If without survey, we use a, like a total passenger of MRT that we can obtain from the uh, MRT operator. And then what, how much share for MRT, which also here default value is also allowed and fixed all the time. And then uh, the uh, vehicle kilometer travel is uh, calculated based on the start and end point of MRT. And then we also can use the default value for occupancy rate of vehicles. So if we use the uh, width survey, and then there's two uh, components that we need, to, we need to consider. First is total passenger of MRT. Which is we can use aggregate data, and then also mode share of MRT, which uh, default value is also allowed and fixed all the time. So, here how to calculate the change of vehicle speed in the parallel road? We use a volume and capacity ratio, and then. From monitoring, we use the PPR function, alpha and beta parameter. This is the formula, uh, the vehicle speed improvement due to MRT project because of some passenger uh, uh, change their mode from a vehicle to MRT. And then the, we, can, we can expect the reduction of uh, using of vehicles, private vehicles. Therefore, we can improve the vehicle speed. This is the idea. Because we can improve the vehicle speed, then we can expect also reduction emission from the road that parallel to the uh, MRT line. So that's uh, about the comparing methodology under the CDM approach and the GCM MRV. So next session, I will talk about the data selection and then its impact on the estimation reliability. In this case, we will use the case study of 
uh, using uh, emission reduction by electric or hybrid vehicles. This is small scale uh, improvement in technology. Uh, here we use a uh, uh, reference is like uh, eco vehicles in uh, India. This is uh, like a project activity to use electric vehicle instead of fossil fuel power scooter in uh, various regions in India. This registered uh, by September 2012, last year, in UNFCCC. Uh, for the basic circulation, again, for the CD, uh, UNFCCC, use an uh, uh, annual vehicle kilometer, which is a bottom-up approach. And then, how, and then to calculate the baseline, they, they use uh, annual kilometers and then vehicle uh, fuel efficiency, and then fuel consumption, and then net calorie of fuel, etc. And for uh, this project, the, the total emission for baseline and prediction of emission reduction based on the market share. So how many vehicles in the market are replaced by uh, electric vehicle that uh, accounted as the emission reduction through the uh, replacing uh, fossil fuel to electric vehicles. And for data for, sam for sample of fuel consumption, they only took from uh, 20 vehicles. And for monitoring, they, they, they will do market penetration monitoring, so like from vehicle sales. Basically, this one. Here, we, we, the case study, we, we want to calculate the G baseline GSC emission from motorcycle taxi in Bandung City. This is a joint research with the uh, uh, Institute of Technology Bandung. So first, we, we did inventory of population of motorcycle taxi and its di distribution in Bandung City last year in 2012. And we, we did several type of data collection or data survey or survey. We, uh, through the different uh, survey, we, we expect uh, how to calculate the fuel consumption and fuel, uh, GSC emission, what the different and uh, how, how big it's different in the total of calculation. So this is just the example how the different data set will affect on calculation of GHG emission. So this is a map of uh, distribution of OJEC station in Bandung. Uh, in total, as data as of June 2012, is the uh, number of station is 169 station. And total OJEC population or OJEC driver is more than 6,000. 6,371 drivers in the whole Banu city as June of 2012. So what kind of survey we, we did? First, we, we have an inventory survey for all population, 6,000, more than 6,000. And then we select about 6.3% of uh, population, which we, will, we follow the international standard uh, for the minimum sample between 5 to 10 percent. So 6.3 percent is follow the minimum standard. Among this, pop this sample, we select 25 percent of them to do deep uh, interview for one week. So we want, we want to compare uh, one day data and one week with the different sam uh, sample size and then how it will affect on the GHG emission calculation. So here the detail of uh, uh, data that we did is a type of survey that we did, like a one day average data. Number of sample is 6.3% uh, of total population. We collect data about average daily trip and then also average fuel consumption. And then for one week data, we, uh, from 100 samples, we collect about the data about the daily travel and then fuel consumption and day of service. So because the, this is paratransit types, the, uh, uh, the service itself in one week uh, is uh, fluctuated. And sometimes they, they, they do service for the whole, whole day. Sometimes they take a off in other day. So we need to have a pattern of day of service, etc. And then within the one week survey, we also uh, apply more detail survey for activity, daily activity, by using a GPS survey. So we, 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 use, we give the GPS to each driver to know their daily activities for on the surface. 
So we want to capture the real time trips, actual travel kilometers, and also actual vehicle speed within one week survey. So it's very clear that we have a three uh, different type of data and then different type of uh, samples. But how this uh, approach will influence on the calculation of GAC emission, that's the final goal for this survey. So from a one, one day survey among 400 uh, drivers, we, we can see that like a vehicle is, is uh, on the mean is uh, 2000, 2006, and then engine size 115, number of trips, is like a 14 trips per day and every distant trip and then so the total the service distant trip is about 30 kilometer and then fuel consumption is on average 2.6 liter to 2.16 liter per day so we can know the, the fuel efficiency per liter on average again from one week survey also we have a number of trip per weeks and then total kilometer service per week. This is from uh, interview survey. And then number of working day per week, this is the 6.4. So uh, at least one, almost one day they take off. And then average fuel consumption also, we get the data. And then, so we can estimate the fuel efficiency. <coughs> Last part, we use uh, GPS data. So, the total travel distance is almost double compared to the previous slide here. Uh, if we use a uh, paper base, the driver only reported about the 80 kilometer. But if we use a GPS data, we, we obtain that the total travel is 191. This is the average. So average speed of a uh, motorcycle is about the 18 kilometers, 18.5 kilometers per hour. And then they also have uh, acceleration, deceleration because of uh, due to traffic in the city. So acceleration, deceleration in the sixty-five uh, percent. And also we can obtain the fuel efficiency. For the fuel efficiency is slightly improved compared to the paper base. Here is one six point zero two, but for paper base is only one three uh, thirteen point forty forty six. So. We, we, we can improve the data collection through the GPS, but you may re remember that uh, collecting data through the GPS is time consuming and cost. Uh, like, uh, so we need to have a, a discussion about uh, how to make a cost effectiveness of data collection for this one. So this is the three different uh, fuel consumption and kilometer service data using a three different uh, data source. The red one is uh, average daily from uh, 400 sample. And the blue one is uh, the <coughs> data F, uh, for one week uh, fuel consumption by interview survey. And the green one is one week fuel consumption by GPS survey. From this uh, graph, we have a uh, First, we, we, we need to have an idea about the non-linear relationship among uh, one day and one week survey for paratransit, especially because the, the, their trip is depend on the ridership and on-demand transit. So the, we, we, this is totally different with the fixed route, fixed service bus system. For paratransit, it's different because the, the, the trip is depend on the ridership and on demand. So we cannot apply like a, in, the, in the method developed by UNFCCC for, uh, for example, like public transport, we can uh, have like a linear relationship between one day or one week operation with one year, something like that. But in case of paratransit, we need to consider more about that one. We, we don't have uh, we, we don't have linear relationship, or we can say there's a non-linear relationship for that one. So as the final one, so we can compare the three, three different data source and its impact on uh, estimation of GHG emission. Here, first, 
we have a fuel consumption for one day data is, for example, 2.16, one week 2.12, but fuel efficiency because of we employ the GPS survey, and then we can get a higher fuel efficiency, once 16.03. So because of this difference, and then when we calculate the, the GHG emission, baseline GHG emission for ton CO2 per year from uh, paratransit service in Bandung from uh, 6,371 drivers for based on the fuel consumption, this is uh, based on the top-down approach, we can have uh, like a basically very high uh, GHG emission here more than 11,000 ton per year. But if we use the fuel efficiency, like uh, uh, as did by the GCM uh, uh, for the CDM approach or under UNFCCC, we can have more conventional, I mean, more conservative uh, estimation, basically lower than the fuel consumption one. As we look here, we can compare if we use a uh, one day data is six six thousand almost uh, more than fifty percent about compared to if we uh, we use a top down approach but if we use one week uh, with a lower sample size with longer uh, observation and then the accuracy is only 40% compared to the top down. But if we use a GPS one, that more detailed one, compared to the paper base, on the, uh, compared to the top down approach, bottom up at top down, the uh, difference is very small between bottom up and top down. So this is give more accurate for if we use the GPS one, but again, this is very expensive and time consuming. So, in the final conclusion for the uh, way forward for developing MRV for GCM transport, first we need to consider experience that already available for MRV transport under the uh, CDM, and then we need to proactive in effort to simplify the methodology, and then how to improve the methodology first. We apply the method to another transport project in Asia by using a bottom-up and top-down approach to get which reliable information and how to compare about the reliability of information at its impact on GHG emission. And then we need to consider about the optimizing survey because it will uh, influence on the cost effectiveness and also accuracy of our uh, GHG estimation. That's the uh, most uh, important point that we need to consider for this uh, research. So that's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh,